What's good, guys? Welcome back to my channel, where I hope you to love the scriptures and to reform to the word of God. Now, as you guys can see, we got my brother with me, Joshua Janir, my best friend. Um, introduce yourself to the people, just real quick, because they already know you. We did like three videos together, but yeah, good to have you. Um, on, yeah, thank you for having me, brother. Um, I'm Joshua. I am turning 18 in two weeks, so that's fun. Uh, I am a servant of the Lord Jesus Christ, and I teach theology on my YouTube channel called Reform Dogmatics. Um, I'm pursuing um, my master's, well, will pursue my BA, my master's, and my PhD. So one day, if the Lord wills, be able to teach systematic and biblical theology somewhere, that's my dream or my goal. But wherever the Lord wants me, I will go. But I have a TikTok, and I post theology on there, and I do apologetics as well. Yes, sir. This man is one of the best theologians in Gen Z. I'm going to link his his stuff in the description. And before we get into the topic, I encourage you to hit the subscribe button and hit the like button and hit the bell to be notified every time I post another video. And as you guys have seen the title, we're going to be talking about the means of grace. You reform theology. You will hear this objection from some people. If predestination is true calvinistic predestination is true why should we preach the gospel and that is the question that we seek to answer today so for yours you can start us off and we'll conversate on this topic yeah um that's a that's a very interesting um topic um it's a very interesting question if calvinism is true then why preach the gospel but, but let's first define some terms what does means of grace mean well, it's in the, the, the word, means of grace, that these are the means that Christ, as the head of the church, has appointed to impart grace through the ministry of the Holy Spirit. Now, the, the way Christ distributes his benefits is by way of covenant, and those who enjoy those benefits are called the covenant communion or the communion of saints. Now, how does Christ communicate his benefits to his people? You know, the mystics deny that he uses means. But as Christians, we must say that Christ uses means to bring people to faith. And I, I just want to, you know, go to the Old and New Testament to show the scriptural proofs for the means of grace. Um, the first passage that I would look at, that I'm going to look at is Ezekiel 37, um, verse 11 to verse 14. Um, this is what um, the word of God says. Then he said to me, son of man, these bones are the whole house of Israel. Behold, they say our bones are dried up and our hope is lost. We indeed cut off. Therefore prophesy and say to them. So look, here is now when we speak of the word of God and the sacraments, we call them the means of grace. Now, how do those means come into efficacy? It is through the ministry of the Holy Spirit by the minister, and the minister would be called the ordinary means of grace. So Ezekiel will now prophesy. So Ezekiel, the prophet, would be an ordinary means of grace. Here we go in verse 12. Therefore prophesy and say to them, thus says the Lord God, behold, I will open your graves and raise you from your graves. O my people, I will bring you into the land of Israel, and you shall know that I am the Lord. When I open your graves and raise you from your graves, O oh my people, I will put my spirit within you and you shall live and I will place you in your land. Then you shall know that I am the Lord and that I have spoken and I will do it and I will do it, declares the Lord. So that is the Old Testament proof of the means of grace. And we can go through all the, the Old Testament books to prove that God uses ordinary means. Moses was an ordinary man. David was an ordinary man. Jeremiah, Isaiah, these were ordinary men. They were prophets. And, and through the ministry of the word, the God in the Old Testament imparted grace to his people. For example, the sacraments, the Paschal Lamb, that is a means of grace. The communion of saints in the Old Testament who participated in that sacrament through the ministry of the Holy Spirit, the Holy Spirit imparted grace to those saints. Now, the New Testament proves that, that as we see the continuity that God still uses means would be 2 Corinthians chapter 4. Um, chapter 4, verse 1 through um, 5, I believe. Verse 1 through 6. Therefore, having the ministry of the mercy of God, we do not lose heart, but we have renounced disgraceful underhand ways. We refuse to practice cunning or to tamper with 
with God's word, but to open the statement of truth, we would commend ourselves to everyone's conscience in the sight of God. And even if our gospel is veiled, it is veiled to those who are perishing. In their case, the God of this world has blinded their minds, has blinded the minds of unbelievers to keep them from seeing the light of the gospel of the glory of Christ, who is the image of God. For we proclaim, for what we proclaim is not ourselves, but Jesus Christ as Lord, with ourselves as your servants for Jesus' sake. For God who said, let light shine out of darkness, Paul is quoting Genesis chapter 1, has shown in our hearts to give light of the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ. And now, just to, I'm going to let you talk and then we'll get into the second point, um, the distortion of the means of grace and the redefining of what the means of grace meant in church history. Notice what it says. Um, for the God who said, let light shine out of darkness, it is God. And now I would turn to my final passage in the New Testament. It would be Ephesians chapter 2. One of my favorite passages. Um, uh, what verse word does he say? Uh, okay, verse 17. Um, I found it. I'm sorry. Verse 17. This is what Paul says. And he came. This is Paul speaking to the people of Ephesus. He says that he came and preached peace to you who were far off and peace to those who were near. Jesus Christ never traveled to Ephesus. Of course, Christ is the one who imparts this grace. So therefore, I can let you speak and then we can get into the second point of the distortion of the, the means of grace throughout church history. So it's a better defining the thing that God uses as a means in order to show me any unmerited favor and by which he acts for my good then becomes a means of grace. So anything that God uses as a means to show us the unmerited favor of God is a means of grace. And he also says means of grace. So he, he has limited the dispensation of grace to the means of grace. So he's only going to, to, to show his grace through the means that he has appointed to show his grace. And as he said, the means of the elect is us. We are his instruments. The preaching of the word, um, the spirit working through the preaching of the word is what brings um, dead sinners to life. And we see this also in Romans chapter 10, verse 17, where Paul says, faith cometh by hearing and hearing through the word of Christ. So through the preaching of the word, the spirit working through the word, um, the spirit effectually is elect. We are his means of grace, ordinary means of grace. And the means of grace is the word um, working through the spirit, with the spirit. Yeah, the, thank you. Um, now, I just I want to get into the second point, the distortion of the means of grace throughout church history. What we see in the patristic era heading into the, the, the Middle Ages is we see a distortion of the means of grace as the church became overly Gentile and influenced by Greek philosophy. Here, um, the form of church government radically changed with Cyprian and the Episcopalian form of church government. You had the bishops and the bishops were the successors of the apostles and had the true tradition. And then going into the Middle Ages with the scholastics, there was no there was there was really no further development of what it mean, what what the church was, what was passed down. By, to the what was passed down from the patristic era to the middle ages was was it the the doctrine of the church according to cyprian and augustine that the church was the dispensary the church as an institution mm. now now and that's why you know roman catholics say that there's no salvation outside of the church because salvation became sacerdotal when Cyprian formed the, the, the Episcopalian form of church government, he called the bishops priests for their sacrificial work. So since, since, since the church became the dispensary of divine grace, which was only through the sacraments that you could only receive through the priests, the logical conclusion is that there's no salvation outside of that Roman Catholic institution. And that's the distortion of the means of grace throughout church history, that the church as an institution, that, that it, you could only receive divine grace and salvation through the institution, through the priest. 
Now, we, we completely deny that because the New Testament completely denies that. What Protestants said is that, no, it is Christ who communicates his benefits through ordinary means. Now, we never separate the work of Christ from the means of grace. We never separate the two. Yeah. What, what the scholastics did in the Middle Ages is that they completely separated the work of Christ. Christ became the church. Christ is the Christ. You know, we are the bride of Christ, but Christ became the physical church on earth, and you could only receive grace through the priests. Protestants, we deny that. In our form of church government, we deny that. In our ecclesiology, we deny that. We say that Christ... We never separate the means of grace from the work of Christ. Christ, through his continual priestly work, continues to impart grace unto his church through the means that he has ordained, through the spirit. So that's why I would say, in our last point, we'll, we'll, get to, we'll get to briefly, I would say that in the Reformation, we rediscovered covenantal Christianity. How does God bring to us, how does God impart his blessings to us? It's by way of covenant. How does God bring us into, into his covenant? It's by the means that he has ordained. Amen. And man, one thing I want to point out as well, because you brought up um, Roman Catholic sac sacramentology, um, sacraments are, are subordinate to the word. The difference between the sacrament and the word is that one of them is necessary and one of them is not necessary. And you can tell which one it is. The word, the preached word is absolutely necessary for salvation. I'm just going to quote my favorite theologian again. He says, the word is absolutely necessary. The sacraments are not absolutely necessary, expressed otherwise. The necessity of the latter does not lie in the sight of God, but on the side of man. And in their, their purpose, they, they differ because the word serves to produce faith and the sacraments serve to strengthen faith so the purpose of the sacraments is to strengthen the faith of the one who is in, in the covenant community but the word serves to produce faith in the heart um, of the unregenerate that's the difference between the word and, and, and the sacraments or we don't completely necessary and one is not and they're both means of grace God yeah. use. If, if, I can, God. if I can, yeah, if I can get into the you know, last point, the Reformation, and especially with the with the formation of our creed of our confessions, right? Um, with you know the the continental reformed um made the um stream that flowed out of the Reformation with Presbyterians, right? What what we said, what we said is that you know we rediscovered covenantal Christianity, that the Christ ha Christ as the second and last Adam has won for us eternal life, and the way he communicates his benefits to us is by way of covenant. That covenant community is called the communion of saints. Now, the question that we're tasking is, how do we become part of that covenant? And how does God sustain us, us as pilgrims in exile? And he sustains us through the means. We're saved by grace through faith. And it's usually through our effectual call, which is through the ministry of the word. And this was a question for reformed pastors in the 17th and 18th century. In infancy, could he, could he, could have, you know, we don't say that God only uses these means. We say ordinarily God uses these means to regenerate and to strengthen the people of God. And God can, God, we, we would say that if God saved somebody apart from the preach word, it would be called the extraordinary. It was extraordinary, but ordinarily God draws his people through his word. And that's, that's what we said at the reformation that, that this is covenantal Christianity. It is Christ who imparts grace to us. It is not an individual and into, for example, a priest who imparts grace to another individual it is christ who imparts grace to us by his means and i just want to as you quoted romans 10 17 earlier um yeah. paul says um in verse 11 for the scripture says everyone who believes in him will not be put to shame but there is no distinction between jew and greek for the same lord of all for the same Lord is Lord of all, bestowing his riches on, on all who call him. For everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. How, so this is, this is, so this is, this is the important, this is, this gets at our, our question. If Calvinism is true, why do we preach the gospel? This is what Paul says, knowing that God has used ordinary means throughout redemptive history. This is what he says in verse 14. How then will they call on him? And how then will they call on him in whom they have not believed? And how are they to believe in him of whom they have never 
never heard in ordinary means. And how are the how are they to preach unless they are sent? As it is written, how beautiful are the feet of those who preach good news, but they have not obeyed the gospel for you. Okay, so I'll, I'll just stop there. And, and as he says in verse 17, so faith comes by hearing and hearing through the word of God. So we see that God has always been using ordinary means to bring his people. For example, the prophets, the priests, those were ordinary means that God used to strengthen the faith of his covenant people. And, uh, and, and yeah, man, you know, we, we, there's, there's the, unfortunately, in modern evangelicalism, there's the mystic side that they completely deny the means of grace. And then you have on the other side, you have Roman Catholics that, that the church, as an institution becomes the means of grace and that's why i love what herman bob and keep what he what he quotes in his and his reformed dogmatics he says the spirit's means of grace because they're only a, they, they only come to effect by the ministry of the spirit they're not found magically in and of itself like the, L the lutherans would say that the power of the word of god is in the word of god itself we deny that but the power Power of the word of God comes to it comes. Yes, sir. I love that. I love that. So basically, the answer to the initial question is God has not only predestined the end, which is the, the glorification of believers. And it's very important to understand that. And this is why we believe um, that this objection to Calvinism is very silly, because when you look throughout scripture, as my brother pointed out god has always used means to uh, of grace he always used means prophets um the priests the judges um and he does that so as well in the new covenant um but yeah yeah, yeah. i mean i mean this i think i think uh it's it's really a bad objection it's really a, just to see i mean this is faith comes by the preaching of, of the word and i love that, that our our confessions of faith. Um, they have a chapter devoted to um, effectual calling. And this is what they say in the Westminster Confession of Faith, chapter 10, section one, all those whom God hath predestined unto life and those only he is pleased to effectually call by his word and spirit. It's, and, and just, to, just to end off with this, the spirit, and the word and the sacraments those are the means that god uses to bring people to faith and to sustain them as they're here as they're pilgrims in exile looking towards their heavenly country amen i love that um today we talked about the word as a means of grace as a means of um but yeah guys if you like that video, I encourage you to hit the like button, share the button, hit the bell to be notified every time I post another video. See you guys in the next video.